Talking with your friends in the school cafeteria is always something to look forward to. On the Lunchbox Reaction Podcast, a teen, a tween, and an adult host a weekly discussion on all things pop culture that appeal to the YA crowd. Whether it's the new streaming TV show, a graphic novel from the library, or that great game everyone is playing, we'll talk about it on Lunchbox Reaction, and we'll try to have a little fun along the way. Listen to us on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, and like and subscribe so you never miss an episode. Lunchbox Reaction. It's like talking with your friends and no food fights. This is RangerCast, episode 24, Cosmic Fury Discussion, episodes 4 through 6, recorded on Saturday, November 25th, 2023. This episode, Power Morphicon announces its first guest, a new Green Ranger for an upcoming comic series, and Jonathan Entwistle's Side Hustle. All right, this is RangerCast. As always, I am Tyler, better known as Judo Voto, and I am joined by... Hello, everybody. Mike Manos here joining you again. I am a Juilliard-trained angle grinder player in my band. All right, so uh, I hope you all enjoyed uh, the interview dropped um, last week. Um, also, be sure to like and follow us on Facebook, Twitter, leave a review on Apple Podcasts. It really helps put us in front of more ears and eyes. So anyway, we're going to have some episode discussion coming up later on episodes 4 through 6 of Cosmic Fury. First, we got a good bit of news to get through. First off, uh, there's going to be a new Karate Kid movie. Now, that might seem weird to put out there on a Power Rangers podcast, but uh, the relevant thing is that Jonathan Entwistle is directing it, so I guess that tells us a little bit about how the reboot's going. I also love how this is the reboot of the reboot. This is the third time they've tried this. Well, it's gonna have it's gonna have Jackie Chan and Ralph Macchio. They're really like entering the Miyagi verse. Yeah, they had the TV show, did they not? Yeah, Cobra Kai. I mean, this is the sort yes. of stuff Cobra Kai's for. I mean, everything has to have an extended universe now. I do not know if the 2010 is that when the Jaden Smith one came out. I do not know if that is when. If that was made to specifically tap into the Eastern market, I've mentioned before that mm. that's why a lot of these remakes are being done, especially with, you know, Disney live action films. Yeah, it was 2010. These, yeah. Yeah. I do not know if that's why they remade the Karate Kid back then or if it was just, you know, a vanity project for the Smiths. But I remember I've never seen the original Karate Kid. I saw the Jaden Smith one and I remember thinking it was OK. And I'm always of the mindset that, you know, if people enjoy these movies, you know, go for it. It keeps people working. Mm-hmm. Now, in Power Rangers news, uh, a fan, actually, this is via Token Nation who got this screenshot from a fan, uh, went on the Hasbro Pulse site for information about the Hasbro Selfie series and found the following answer. While we appreciate your interest, we are no longer accepting new orders for the Hasbro Selfie series figures. Uh, for those who forget, these allowed you to use their app to put your face on a red, yellow, or black MMPR lightning collection figure or other figures and properties Hasbro owns, like Ghostbusters, what have you. Um, I don't know why they would be killing it off, but whatever happened happened uh, only a couple weeks ago because the answer was dated. Uh, at the time it was posted as being from two days ago. I have nothing to add about this. I, I'm not very familiar with the selfie series, so. I mean, it was I a cool really idea. Can't... It was yeah. something nobody else was doing. Like, I had, like, you know, just, there wasn't that long ago, I believe they were giving them out with, like, at a convention with, like, special sleeves or something like that. Um, the, the only thing I can remember that's even remotely tangential to that is that app that they used to have on social media God, 15 years ago 10 years ago where you could make yourself as a south park character and then i believe you could buy merchandise of that yeah yeah but this was a pretty cool technology because they were kind of refining it as the as the tooling technology got better like for example they were able to do the removable gla- removable glasses thing that yeah. some of the lighting collect like the kendrick's figure uh was doing yeah i mean 
we talked about in the past how, you know, how crazy the toy lines are these days and, and figures and merchandise, so. Mm-hmm. Who knows why? Who knows the reasoning behind it? Also in Power Rangers News, we got an update on the return, which is the Boom Studios uh, limited comic book series co-written by Amy Joe Johnson. By the way, that Kickstarter now sits at more than $400,000 as we record this on Saturday night with 3,639 backers and 16 days to go. Now, remember, this project is happening either way, but this is the way they do pre-orders, build hype, and also they uh, actually share some of the proceeds with the creators, not just of the comics, but of the um, the stretch goal items, like the art prints, what have you. Um, and they have been reaching these stretch goals. Uh, right now, their most their most recent stretch goal was to add a sticker set to all reserved orders for physical items like the soft cover, hard cover, etc. When they reach five thousand five hundred thousand dollars, they will add a prelude story for Mighty Morphin Power Rangers Reimagine to the uh, Return Collected Edition. And there are a few more stretch goals after that they have not yet announced, but they probably will reach. And an update given to Kickstarter backers the other day, they revealed. Uh, uh, who the female Green Ranger was that is seen in some of the art. Her name is Olivia Hart. She's the daughter of Kimberly and Tommy. Now remember, this is a universe where the peace conference didn't, ha- where the power transfer didn't happen, I should say, where you know the whole cat storyline didn't happen, where the Rangers Gen stayed universe. together. Yeah, yeah, where the Rangers stayed together, and some other things happened down the line after they defeated Zed. And they, they released the... not monkey for the Power Rangers universe, pretty yeah. much. <laughs> they released the uh, design, not just for, you know, the new Green Ranger, but for Olivia herself, the design by Dan Mora. And, um, look, she looked pretty cool. Though there was a little drama around this in regards to the folks at Bad in the Sun who are making Legend of the White Dragon falsely claiming credit for some of the story. When they didn't, they didn't necessarily know for sure that this is the direction they would go with it. But there, but there are like a thousand different fix, thousand different fix where Tommy and Kim end up together. So it wasn't that hard to guess that maybe that's what they were doing. I just think it was maybe a bit callous of them to make that accusation and exploit this project for hype around the anniversary of Jason David Frank's death. Yeah. You mean to tell me the bat in the sun is looking for a way to make a quick buck because they are, they probably are desperate for some funding. Oh, you don't say that, that that's a little bit out of, that's a little bit out of the realm of possibility there. I mean, it's a bit complicated because, you know, it seems crude and classless, but at yeah, the same sure time, Jenna Frank herself is to some extent, a willing participant in this. In whatever, yeah. in their attempts to try to be able to make something happen in the MMPR universe that Hasbro is not under any obligation to allow. That's why Legend of the White Dragon happened. Yeah, it's one of those things where it's a lot of he said, she said, and we do not necessarily know for sure the involvement that all the parties have and how much. Uh, copyright law they are you know privy to or how much they're you know allowed to have we do not know exactly the breakdown of the intellectual property and who made what part of the story so that's the thing and I feel like this happens more and more nowadays is people maybe it's just more out in the open because of social media but people just being you know more vocal about saying OG content, do not steal, but with way more money involved. Yeah, and, you know, Bad in the Sun was making stuff using Power Rangers characters, but at the end of the day, that is all, like, at the pleasure of the people who own Power Rangers. Yeah. But they are making, uh, they are making Legend of the White Dragon, which is in post, I believe, coming out sometime next year. I'm not going to check my notes on that. There's a two-pack coming out from the company Valiverse of the White Dragon and 
Black Dragon? I don't, I don't know. It doesn't say. Um, that do feature alternate heads, all that. Ultimately, the two suits are practically just palette swaps of each other. Each of the figures includes a weapon and a stand and alternate hands. Uh, and that is fifty nine ninety nine and available from valiverse.com. We will link it in our show notes. The figure set is set to ship in April of 2024. Yeah. And we also got some Power Morphicon news. Shiori Zumi, who played Dragon Ranger and Change Pegasus in Sentai, he is going to be making his first U.S. convention trip. He doesn't do cons really all. Like he's like way, way out of the business. I think he has a restaurant or something. But he is going to be at Power Morphicon. He is the first officially announced guest. And if you go to register for Power Morphicon, if you go to the registration page, I should say, you can get, they're doing the Lightning Pass deal again, where you can pay to get to the front of the line, be guaranteed an autograph, obviously includes the autograph. But that Lightning Pass is $300. And I guess given, you know, knowing how kind of that back corner of the exhibition hall operates, I think, I think that's going to be a really long line all weekend. Yeah, and I know some people were kind of turning their noses up at the price, but that might be a case where we do not know if it's necessarily Power Morphicon setting that price or if it is, you know... Jiro Izumi's people that is setting the I, price. Like like you said, he's so far removed from the industry. Maybe this is a case of, mm. all right, I'll do it, but I need to make X amount of money in order to make it worth my time. Well, I think, you know, last Power Morphicon, the Lightning Passes um, for, for Ryoto Ozawa and one of the other actors were around that price. Right. So I think... I think it's kind of economics. I'm not sure like how much of the in. difference between the normal autograph price and the $300 uh, Izumi or Toku Spirits, who is bringing him, would be pocketing. But if somebody's willing to pay $300, then someone's willing to pay $300. And also, there is a trailer out for Garo, the Inheritor of Steel. It's the uh, new Garo series features Yuga Dogai returning as Gato. He faces a new challenge when confronted by another warrior in strange steel armor. It is supposed to begin airing on Tokyo MX and Nitere in January of 2024. Also, we mentioned a while back the Decker Ranger anniversary movie that's coming out next year. There is another Memorial Edition release coming out along with the uh, SP license. We are getting a Memorial Edition D Sword Vega, also in Power Rangers SPD as the Shadow Saber. We don't know, this is from Token Asian, what the price point will be or when it's coming out. All we know is it exists and there's a picture of it and it looks sick. I actually had a D-Sword Vega. Like, it got one back, like, 2004, 2005, like, picked up at a con or something. And I don't know what came over me. I gave it over to Database Ranger to give away as a trivia prize at the first Power Morphicon. Oops. Maybe that's it. <laughs> It was sick though. I never even took it out of the box because I like I was like nervous about taking it out of the box. Yeah, I got gotcha. you. You know what? I mean, keep in mind that was 16 years ago. You know, mindsets are totally different at that point, so you can't really beat yourself up too much over that. Yeah, I don't even know who won it. Maybe you can get it back. Maybe it'll be a giveaway in the next trivia contest. I don't know. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, the Tsuburaya Convention 2023 happened, and Tsuburaya announced a bunch of projects relating to their uh, Ultraman stuff, anime, films, that sort of thing. Uh, they also announced a live-action project titled Schoolgirl vs. Ultraman. Uh, Tsuburaya described it as an entirely new human drama with a female protagonist based in the new generation Ultraman setting. That means everything from Ultraman Ginga on. Uh, Tsuburaya indicated that Schoolgirl vs. Ultraman, which will have the subtitle Holly Rock, whatever that means, is already in production. And they also announced a documentary series held the origin of Ultraman. And one of the people who is set to take part in that series is Guillermo del Toro, the Oscar winning director. And, you know, it makes sense that he would be in something like that. Yeah. I mean, the man made Pacific Rim one, the good one. So like the, he's obviously, video, a, yeah. he's obviously a fan of the genre. And in terms of names, 
to serve as, you know, a Western audience's POV into the genre that may not know it. I mean, you have Guillermo, and I guess maybe James Gunn would be in one that they could reach out to, but there aren't that many people in this on this hemisphere that could really serve that role, so I'm glad to see Guillermo uh, getting to be involved in a genre that he's passionate about. Yeah, I'm not sure if this is going to be something... Like, he's just going to be interviewing it. I'm not sure if it's going to be distributed in the West. Um, but it makes sense of something Guillermo del Toro might do, just because he's a weeb. Like, huge weeb. Like, yeah. uh, he was when they were shooting Pacific Rim, the young Japanese child actress playing uh, the, the young version of Ringo Kikuchi's character was having trouble with the name with his name and he just said just call me Totoro. Well there you go. Yeah. So uh we're gonna take a break. When we come back we have reviews of the concept Curie episodes, Teamworks, Rock Out and Take Off. We'll be right back. And we are back. We've got more discussion of Power Rangers Cosmic Fury, of the middle of Power Rangers Cosmic Fury, starting with the episode Teamworks, which is where the Rangers find Zato. Uh, it opens on the planet Levina, the forest planet Levina. Ollie and the monsters are there looking for Zato. We see Mick again. They came, they came across him. Uh, and then the Rangers and arrive. has got to conquer her fear of heights. Yeah, I know. I Yeah, teamwork. Uh, yeah, I realize. Entertainment Earth's Black Friday sale is on. They've got a deal for buy one, get one 50% off on all in-stock action figures. And through Wednesday, November 28th, use the code HOLIDAY39 at checkout for free shipping on any order, $39 and up. Just use the link in our show notes and save a bundle on your next Power Rangers haul. They did re- kind of reuse... There's a space, though. It makes it different. Um, eh, but I'll, I guess. We see the upgrade that Scrozzle built for Ollie. The way he... He summons it like pounding the ground, like like seen in the Dino Fear Morph. That was pretty cool. Yeah, and I know a lot of people have talked about Ollie, his new suit, uh, which we can actually talk about now because it premieres in this episode. Um, I do think a lot of the reaction toward the suit is a little overblown. It's good. I don't think it's the best thing ever. It just looks like a uh, a custom. What are they called? This is it's been so long since I've seen Dino Fury. The Dino Fury key, like the armors that they use. Yeah. Yeah, it just looks like one of those. So it's a good base point. I mean, that shade of blue and black are always going to look good together. So you know, kudos to them to making it look good. But I do think people are uh, they're making it sound cooler than it actually is. I think also his suit is a slightly darker shade of blue than it was before. Yeah, I mean the. Ryu Soldier shade of blue was definitely a more pastel shade, something that we had seen previously in Gosager. It's kind of that shade of blue, like a middle level blue, like a slate blue almost. But maybe that is just, you know, a difference between the fabrics that were available when they made their suits, similar to how whenever you see a gold or silver ranger uh, in some sort of metallic, they have, you know, the suit where they're posing, where everything's nice and shiny. And then you have the more matte version. And the style of the armor clash, like conceptually clashes, but also at the same time works a bit like when Adam wore the Defender vest in uh, Once and Always. No, in the same way that Adam wore the Defense... Yeah, the same way that Adam wore the Defender vest in Once a Ranger. Yeah, I get that. But I mean, the... Black Mighty Morphin suit is just white and black, so it's very hard for something to really clash with that, especially when the Defender Vest had such silver prominently on it as an, as a border color. Well, also, like, one side kind of mimicking the suit, one side of the shoulder is, well, one shoulder, I should say, is black and the other is blue, just like his suit. Yes, I agree. I do think it's a little silly that it's a definitively blue suit because I you can, I guess you could call it. It's not. Is it really a power up or is it like internally? Do they refer to this as a different ranger entirely or is it just like a different mode 
of the Blue Ranger powers, similar to like the Gold Ranger form. I don't think he, I don't think they call it anything. No, yeah, I don't think they call it anything. Yeah, but I'm seeing like internally, it's like how the term Ghost Ranger was never actually used in show. Yeah, I don't know. I don't think that's a question that Simon answered before he uh, got off Twitter and went on vacation. Well deserved, by the way. Um, hmm. But I do wonder, you know, what they call it and how they differentiate it internally down in Auckland. That's kind of really uh, inside baseball sort of question. Yeah. And the Rangers do morph, and I believe this is the only roll call we get all season. It is. Which is kind of a bummer because you think, you know, they'd wait maybe a few more episodes, if you know what I mean, if they only, if they were only going to get one. Uh, but it was cool to to see that drawn out a little more. But it's clear that I mean, maybe like everything in the season, it came down to time. I think that's exactly what it was. And I do enjoy roll calls. I will say that Dino Fury probably had one of the weakest just because it was all stock footage the whole time. So seeing that, I, that's I actually what they think that made it stronger. I think that made it stronger. I don't know about that. It just seems like an extended morph sequence, where it's just long for the sake of being long. Cutting I, it, I I like it more when it's done on set where they're going to have the battle. I know it's a, it's ridiculous because the monster would clearly be waiting for there, but it gives you know more of a sense of place as to okay, here's where we are. We're showing who we are. And we're just kind of, you know, puffing our chests out, saying that we're not afraid, we're gloating, we're going to kick well, your butt. If they can't use pyro, you know... Oh, I, I, I'm not talking pyro, I'm just talking right. about like when they actually say their stuff. Well, no, it, yeah, but if they can't use pyrotechnics, I think that what Dino Fury did, like having the morph theme, when the morph theme continue into that, that, I think... Personally, I really enjoyed it because, especially because of the way it was done, it didn't feel like they were st staying in the same place because those shots all felt like they were in motion. It wasn't like like Samurai where their morphs would take five minutes because they would all do the morph, do the roll call bit, and then do the next morph, the next morph, and so on and so forth. This way, because the morph is always split screen it feels like a compromise between those two options. True. I mean, it's mostly a matter of opinion. To me, the roll call kind of seemed more like a, a screensaver than a roll call, just because of how it was, you know, how the shot was composited, but, or composed, I guess would be the real word. But, I don't it's know, not, tomato, it's, tomato. It's like, comic, it's like a comic book splash page. I really don't have a problem with it. Yeah, it's just a stylistic decision that I personally didn't care for, but that is a me thing. That doesn't mean it was bad. Yeah. But then we saw the uh, the fight with the Zentals. That was really cool because we got to see, their, at last, we got to see the sorts of things their weapons could do. Yeah. Uh, I will say, overall, and I, this is not really spoilering yeah. much of anything, the Z people have their problems with the Zentals, I understand. I like the Zentinels more than the Hengemen. Because I feel like they come off as more memorable. Maybe because they remind you a bit of the uh, Quantrons. See, I didn't like the Quantrons. I think it's more that a lot of the stuff that they are allowed to do uh, in terms of dialogue, in terms of know background stuff that they're doing there there's more personality with the Zentinels, i think than there ever hey everybody and welcome to your favorite show about classic cartoons from the 80s and 90s it's knowing is half the podcast join ray stacanus hi robert clark chan Ugh. and me gina Ippolito, as we explore the worst and the best but mostly the worst that children's animation has to offer now i know what you're thinking but why would I, a grown-ass adult, want to revisit my childhood during this time of strife and turmoil when everything is literally on fire? Uh, hey, isn't this going to sound kind of dated and weird when the world actually calms down? 
We're all going to die. We've got nearly 500 episodes covering everything from the awesomeness of the entire 80s Sunbow series G.I. Joe to the weirdness of Cartoon All-Stars to the Rescue to the weirdness of Hey Arnold to the weirdness of Chuck Norris and the Karate Commando. Okay, Gina, they get it. They spelled commandos with a K. Knowing is half the podcast. Find it on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. If it was in your butt, you'd know. Is that a tagline? We're with the henchmen. So I think they're more memorable, mm. even divorced I, from I, the Z connection. Yeah, and I think they actually get to like say real things now and then. Yes. So the Rangers, after meeting Mick, they discover that Mick found a piece of Zato's cape, and the Rangers go find his impact crater and the piece of his saber, and then they become one with the trees after. Amelia and Ion mind meld with the trees and gain their trust. And we actually did get to see Mick do a real morph. Not like a real one with the stock footage and everything, but like real as we got, got to see him say Ninja Spin. Yeah. That was cool. I thought, I thought Kelson definitely brought his A game with this episode. Like the moments that he had as he's being held captive by the Zentinels. And he's just, you know, cheekily turning to one of them and saying, like, oh, yeah, the Rangers are here. You know, you guys are are done for and stuff like that. That's just, uh, it's just such a, one of those things where it was a minor role for the episode, but he definitely um, put more effort in than maybe was necessitated. And it definitely helped add to the character. Yeah, and it's always great to see Kelson, and especially now that he gets to be a ranger without needing to not eat for a couple weeks, which right. was the case when he had that scene in Ninja Seal where he kind of kept it secret that he was going to have that scene. Yes. But I'm really happy for him that he got this kind of hero moment in the show. So Ion communes with the big tree and Bree's his friend Zato. And the tree says something to Zato, telling him to enjoy the time he has left, which is, as Ion points out, kind of foreboding. And they try to kind of figure out something it could mean that doesn't mean he's going to die. But it's pretty clear that they're foreshadowing he's going to die. Yeah, that's what happens when you have a... um. A planet where the trees are essentially, I guess when you cut them down, they immediately turn into inspirational quote signs that you can see in a kind of a hokey country store. Like you can hang in your, like, or have it as a throw pillow on your couch. That's and what I got they, from that universe. They don't need the Lorax. The trees speak for themselves. They sure do not. This ain't the planet of the Truffulas. All right. And moving on, we go to probably the closest thing that this 10-episode season has to a standalone episode. It's called Rock Out. You get it? It's because they're digging the Zord out of a rock. And also, there's a concert where they are rocking out. Double pun. Which is better than, which is way better than the episode title of Teamwork, which was really dumb. Whatever. So it begins with Javi disrupting the rest of the Rangers, while he's composing a song and playing the drums. And he talks about how he's you know really kind of getting used to his new arm, which you thought he was already getting used to, but, you know, whatever. It's good to see him happy. Yeah. And then, yeah, and then they uh, see a news report, a fun writer cameo, Steve McCleary, who's one of the uh, writers on the show. He plays the interviewer talking to Bajillionaire from this uh, rock planet. Uh, it's from oh, Galaxy yeah. Quest. Yet, anyway, yeah, he's talking to uh, he's talking to Bajillionaire on this rock planet called Acrawl, where there's a mine where they are kind of like Serpentera, unearthing a, a dragon sword. So the Rangers come up with this plan to go there masquerading as a metal band using a bunch of reused costume parts and props that uh, that Solon apparently had lying around from her earlier life as a props assistant on Power Rangers, I guess. As you do. 
And Fern actually volunteers because she knows how to play the drums and they need somebody to be there to throw off Ollie's count because they don't know that she's there to allow Zato to sneak into the tent where he can access the dragon sword undetected. And it's a really cool sequence, a really funny sequence where the Rangers in these disguises and fake voices try to talk their way in and then put on this concert that everybody, every monster in the mining base falls for. And it's a yeah. really fun scene. And they, as I understand, they were all really in those costumes. Like there's a video that uh, Jacqueline Joe posted of her playing the drums kind of in practice for this scene. Yeah, you can definitely tell um, that Tessa's there because she her mask is so different compared to the other ones. You can definitely tell it's her, especially with the reveal scene when they're caught afterwards. This is such a minor point, and uh, I do want to point out that I recognize this and I appreciate it. So I DJ, and it has always been a pet peeve of mine whenever you see a movie or a television show where they have you know a band or a DJ set up. And they'll put the speakers up, but they'll never have chords attached. And they'll just kind of have it set up. And they'll have, you know, guitars and musical instruments with nothing plugged in. And they'll just be, you know, air guitaring their faces off. And people are like, oh, yeah, this is totally realistic. I don't know why they felt that they absolutely had to take sound chords and plug them into the speakers that were in the back. And to make sure that the chords were plugged into the instruments. But they had all their bases covered and everything was plugged in. And... No one's going to pay attention to that, but I really paid attention to whatever production assistant was like, hey, we should probably plug this stuff in so it looks right. Where they're getting because, electricity from, I don't know, but... Well, because they know the particular fans who are going to be nitpicking the hell out of this are looking for that sort of thing. Yeah. It is amusing to me that the instrumentation that they have for the band is they had Tessa... They, Tessa, they had Izzy on vocals. Amelia was on bass. Burn on drums, Javi on guitar, and Ion on angle grinder. Yeah, I, I noticed that. I mean, that's a tough instrument to learn. It is, but no safety equipment whatsoever. It's like cat in the helmet and once and always, I swear. But it always amuses me. I don't know if it is a mandate for because it's a, ch a children's show. It always amuses me when these kinds of shows their idea of what metal music is is always really bad <laughs> which implies that they're kind of sort of mocking the genre i understand that they you know they're not going to start playing cannibal corpse type stuff on a y7 show but it's always a little amusing to me that the uh, the children friendly version of metal is always you know super growly super you know guttural and there's an angle grinder there because that's metal so i i always get tickled with that kind of stuff yeah you know if solon had different stuff lying around they could have shown up as guar they could have but i think that may have been a reference over the kids heads <laughs> but fern in this episode is really impressive the way she keeps taking steps towards becoming a ranger that sort of selflessness um yeah. but they do morph and there's this big confetti explosion we don't get pyrotechnics in this one but we get a confetti explosion i thought that was really cool yeah and now, why did they have confetti available at the you know the active work site but and why why did it blow on cue you know i don't i don't know is there a spy in it? i don't know but it was still a really cool scene uh the rangers do steal the dragon zord but ollie pops a tracker on it when they get back to the base after defeating uh the scuttle worms on the moon they learn that Tarek is leading the resistance on earth telling them yeah. what's up including that centaur is about ready to pop uh but we never see her actress which i, I guess might have been come down to scheduling or whatever because i know yeah this... i don't think they were able to get her and yeah i don't know maybe she was at home with the kid or something like that Very but possible. this the show did film really fast like right after power Morphicon, and just like the course of a few weeks and i forget her actress's name unfortunately but she siobhan was definitely marshall. yes siobhan 
And that was definitely a blink and you miss it moment uh, for her even being a PMC. Even if you go back and watch the uh, footage of the panel that they all did, she says maybe two sentences. I do feel bad for her, but she was also in a position at that point where a lot of her story had not been shown yet. That's right. Yeah. So I think the most we get of her in Cosmic Fury is a picture. Yeah. But it was probably um, just a scheduling thing where they couldn't get Yeah. Her. Yeah. And Tarek tells the Rangers about an anti Zord force field surrounding Earth that can be deactivated if the Rangers take down a squidrel. But to do that, of course, they have to get down Earth. And well, to do that, of course, they also need to leave Eridus, which five episodes in, they've not been able to do. Yeah. But that takes us to our next episode, which is Takeoff. Takeoff, where the Mega Maid gets to go from suck to blow, and they can finally get rid of the force field. I thought not it was quite. the Marvels that did that. Uh, let me tell you that there's been a couple different franchises that have stolen from Spaceballs over the years. I mean, I, I enjoyed the Marvels, let me be clear, but that's that's another story entirely. Yeah. So the Rangers are... Into too much, because that, that's a really recent movie to come out. Yeah. So the Rangers are clearing out tentacle monsters on Eridus <clears throat> before they can actually, you know, take off when Solon is dino by Scuttleworms. Zato, and this is the first hint we get of this, uses his Morphin Master magic to figure out where Solon is being held and what the situation is like. But we see for the first time that it takes a lot out of him and he's sidelined for a bit. And Fern again knows she can help. And while the other Rangers are out trying to either locate Fern or they're busy trying to get the ship ready to go, uh, she uses that information and a spare morpher to teleport to where Solon is being held and take care of business herself. Now, going there, she makes clear, like, you know, like she grabs more for just because she thinks she'll, you know, be able to use the blaster. But, but you when... you say spare more for that was the one meant for Ollie, right? That's right. That's right. She takes this more for her and frees, uh, frees Solon, oh. rescues her from the baby scuttleworms, and then they're attacked by the scuttleworms, and while trying to defend Solon, the Morpher starts to glow and he becomes the Orange Ranger, maybe because she's wearing orange, but also the details of her suit, Solon notes, are influenced by the Solanosaurus, like her. Which I thought that was a really cool note. Do you remember in the last episode of Ranger Cast I was on where we talked about the issues I had with Amelia becoming red and how, you know, why wasn't she just pink the whole time and pink was just the leader and I believe it was Josh making the argument about how the Morphin, well, you know, the Morphin Grid decided in that moment that uh, she was exhibiting enough properties where red was the color that she needed to exhibit. Yeah. Well, we, well we've never seen orange before, so what's that doesn't really work consistently through the entire thing. I mean, cool. It's probably one of those th cases where, you know, they just... Screw it, we need to come up with an original suit. What color have we never done before? Orange? All right, throw it in there. Why not? I mean, we've had close to orange. You know, we've had Cat Ranger and Rhino Ranger was pretty close to orange. And, you know, obviously SPD Orange Ranger, but that that's a dream sequence. Congratulations, Fern. You're a new Mauve Ranger. Well, no, what I'm saying is, you know, they could have done yellow. They could have done a bunch of other things. So I'm sure that they just did orange as this cool. a nod to the fans. I'm sure yeah. they did. There, there's been a pretty vocal group of people, especially online, saying, well, why are we skipping every Sentai that has an Orange Ranger in it? There's, it's been like an ongoing inside joke. As you know, Tokuger had an Orange Sixth Ranger, and they skipped that. And I think, uh, I Q think Ranger they did obviously it. had Stinger, who was Orange, and they, they yeah. did skip Q Ranger. So, you know, the precedence is there and something people picked up on. Well, I think... <laughs> I mean, again, you know, from the jump, when they got the Zords, Billy said, eh, anybody can use any Zord they like. But I think they were just looking at the colors of the Zords and saying, hey, orange is a cool color. Yeah, and maybe I'm not, I'm not sure at what point 
in the development that what decisions were made. Yeah, because, I mean, if you go by the Q Ranger Zord colors, I mean, what were the options that are even available that weren't used? You have orange, you have yellow, um, purple, I guess. That would have been kind of cool. Um, they could have been reused pink if they really wanted to, but maybe that would have looked weird. Or maybe they just felt that because Fern's suit is, for all intents and purposes, uh, pretty much a retool of the red suit. Maybe they just felt it looked best with an orange deco? Yeah, don't know. I mean, ultimately we're spitballing because, I mean, we know that helmets are expensive and they weren't yes. about to go out and design and fabricate a new one. Right. But I did really like the story beat of how Solon was her dinosaur. I really did appreciate that. And uh, it allowed for Solon to have that much of a closer connection to the team. And meanwhile, we've seen Squillia reference her crush, and we finally learned who that is. It's Heckle, and he's he's being as suave as ever, visiting from another Don't universe. Get your paycheck, Ryan! <laughs> yeah, I know, and he's got his goggles and everything. I mean, he can't have been on set for more than a few days, really, considering sure. exactly how much he has to do. But it's, it's so great to see him, even though we don't know exactly, you know, what or why he might be up to, because... I'm not sure how many of the kids watching this remember uh, Dino Fury, but those of us who do remember that he was good egg by the, uh, there I go quoting him. I'm getting ahead of ourselves that he was by the end, he was tasked with basically doing keeper's job. So what obviously the comics tell a version of his journey from there to here, but it is very good to see him again. And, and so... obviously we'll talk more about Heckle because he primarily appears in the following episode, episode seven, which is going to be uh, the next episode of Ranger cast where we discuss yeah. the season. Uh, but he does appear in six and I feel like they should have maybe had a quick little 10 second flashback thing to show who he was, because it's like you said, I know fury not Dino Fury, excuse me. Dino Char- Dino Supercharge was seven years ago. That's right. That's right. So um, I, I mean, you could kind of get away with it with mm-hmm. Mick because Ninja Steel was 2017, 2018. And, you know, he also ap- had a whole episode where he appeared in season one of Dino Fury. So the groundwork had already been laid there and he explained, you know, who he was and how he was connected with the grid and the Ninja Steel Rangers and everything. I know that they didn't really have the time to do that with Heckle, but I feel like they should have. If I were going in blind without having seen the previous seasons, I would have been completely lost on who this guy was. Well, he does explain who he is briefly when he gives up the the goose. But I think my issue is I wish that, like in later episodes, Tarek references a spy. I wish that Tarek had referenced the spy or found time to reference it during his message to the Rangers. But then again, he doesn't know who might be intercepting that because he might, he might very well know what happened with a message that Mick tried to send the Rangers early in the season that yeah, ended up being intercepted by Ollie, but he's already telling them so much about the anti Zord field. Maybe he should have mentioned the spy too. Yeah. If he was I mean, that sure that it wouldn't be intercepted. Yeah. But again, it's because of the clip that this season is moving at where I feel like they just didn't have the luxury of throwing that in. Mm-hmm. Something we haven't and talked it, about at all this episode is Billy, because one of the problems I've had with Cosmic Fury is Billy is really um, active in the beginning of the season. But by this point, he's kind of dropped off. Yeah, he's just kind of there. But I mean, he's participating in fights, but he's not getting any like character moments. He's the guy in the chair exactly and at the end of the episode we get a coda with uh with fern you know with izzy and fern yeah at the end of the episode we get a coda with izzy and fern uh kind of talking over everything because fern has been very intentionally trying to keep her out of harm's way but fern has been feeling sort of sidelined through all this and kind of uh kind of reconcile over that because she was so worried about she felt guilty 
about having gotten Fern into this mess where she's halfway across the universe. Uh, but she realized that Fern just wants to help, and now Fern is able to help. Not more able to help, I should say, now that she has a morpher. Yeah, and it's nice to see the payoff of, what was that, essentially a five-episode story arc for the two of them? Mm Mm-hmm. So, it is nice, especially in this franchise, to see uh, a story thread persist for that long and have an actual payoff at the end. I mean, obviously, I, as an adult fan, uh, even... If I did not know the unfortunately spoiled fact that Fern was going to become an Orange Ranger, I would have... It's pretty easy to suss out that that's what was going on, that's what the plan was. I mean, why else would they really keep Fern around for the entire season unless they were going to do something like that? It's one of the... It's like that trope where if you're watching a mystery movie, and if the first ten minutes happens, and a character kind of comes and goes, and you're like, well, what was the point of that character? Nine times out of ten, that was the person who did it, because... They wouldn't write the character in unless they had a point of being there. So and I feel like that's kind of what they did with Fern. Like, that's why they brought her on the spaceship in, se- in episode two. They're like, well, if she's going to be around, why would they bring her around just to go, ooh, shiny and everything? No, they're going to have a purpose for her later on. But again, that comes with, you know, being in my mid-30s and having seen stories like this once in a while. I'm sure if you were a kid watching this and if you had been watching all three seasons, you would have probably loved that Fern became a ranger. And you probably wouldn't have seen it coming. Yeah, so, uh, but yeah, I definitely enjoyed the, uh, the, let me start the sentence go over again. My mouth's getting ahead of my brain. So yeah, I definitely enjoyed these uh, three episodes, revisiting these three episodes, especially as we uh, get ready next to tackle on the next three episodes, uh, episodes six through nine, and then we'll tackle the finale in the season as a whole in an episode after that. So that'll be coming in the next few weeks. And also, uh, I just want to remind you guys that I am going to be at Anime NJ in New Jersey. And where else would it be? In Woodcliffe Lake, New Jersey, uh, December 15th through 17th. I am doing a panel on the history of Tokusatsu uh, on the Friday afternoon. I'm really looking forward to it. I actually need to get back and maybe do some research tomorrow. But definitely check that out, and if you see me, say hi. Um, but anyway, that is a wrap. Um, Mike, where can everybody find you on Twitter? Uh, I haven't been on Twitter in years. Okay, where can they find you everywhere else? Um, well, <laughs> they can. you can find me. Uh, my main social media aspect is YouTube. I'm on YouTube at Torgo Entertainment, where I don't do any toku stuff, really. It's mostly DJ-related videos and music videos. But I do have clips that I throw in to honor uh, my Toku fandom roots. You can also find me on Instagram at Torgo Entertainment and Facebook as well at Torgo Entertainment. I try to stay consistent with the branding of everything. But if you're looking for stuff that's relevant to this podcast, maybe that's not going to be your cup of tea. But it's still there if you want it. All right. And as always, you can find us on Twitter, Facebook, RangerCast.net. We're in nearly everywhere just you know google us so thank you so much for listening we will see you next time if you like we just heard find us at rangercast.net or look us up in your favorite podcast app reach out to us on twitter or leave a voicemail on our website the opening theme is by daniel park the ending theme is by me rangercast is distributed under creative commons license a tribute and share alike. like